welcome to the Redmen TV. I'm joined by special guest Rafa Honigstein, the author of Klopp, Bring the Noise, a new book. When is it out, Rafa? It's out now. It's out now, okay. And in so the shops. I've, in the shops, there you go. And online. And online. And of course, online. Uh, so we got Rafa into the studio. Thanks for your time, first and foremost. I know you're busy at the moment, uh, other places to go and other people to see and stuff. But uh, great to sit down with you. I really wanted to pick your brain on the Liverpool side of things from the book, obviously. I suppose the first question for me, Raf, is why Klopp? Why this book? Well, when he signed a deal to come over uh, in October 15, there was such tremendous demand um, to find out more about him, about his background, both biographical but also on the footballing side of things. And I was part of the BT Sport uh, coverage before his first game mm -hmm. uh, at Spurs. And it felt like an FA Cup uh, final day, you know, like hours and hours of uh, previews on Klopp. And I just realised it was just, just, just that tremendous interest in him. And you couldn't really... Um, quench it by just writing uh, articles or you know doing little features so fairly fairly early on from when he started out at Liverpool I felt that this was would be a great subject for a book uh, and also uh, sort of for more kind of a more selfish point of view I really enjoy the research side of things mm -hmm. I really enjoy going to Germany and um, talking to former players of his talking to the, the people at the clubs and I realized that that would be really uh, a super cool project to do. Mm -hmm. So when there was a lot of interest for the book, um, I was very happy to do the deal and start writing. So who, who did you go and speak to then? Uh, There's about 40 people, maybe 50. Um, I spoke to uh, his sister, the people he went to school with, the, his first coaches, the people he played with uh, at Mines, the people then who were uh, under him at Mainz as players, uh, the sport, former sporting director at Mainz who had this idea of taking Klopp as a player and putting him suddenly on the bench from one day to the next, Christian Heidel, the people at Dortmund, former players, uh, people in the backroom staff, uh, and some people at Liverpool as well. Uh, Adam Lalana, Mike Gordon was very, uh, very generous with his time. I had a a couple of phone calls with him and he said to me, whenever you want to talk about Jürgen, you can call me because I love talking wow. about Jürgen. So that was nice. And uh, yeah, everybody was tremendously helpful because you got the sense that people like Jürgen so much that they also want to kind of share it with everybody and, and explain to people what it is that they like so much. It was very hard to find anyone who sort of had an axe to grind or, or grudges. Um, people just genuinely seemed to like the guy. Well, you mentioned Heidel uh, at Mines, and one of the really interesting stories from the book that uh, that I found interesting anyway was that story that you mentioned, was him plucking Jürgen Klopp to be next manager from a player. What, what went through his mind to get to that stage? Yeah, well, he told me that he'd been at, uh, at the end of his wits, basically. He tried so many different coaches he had run out of ideas of who could make a coach for Mainz. They had, they had very little money. They had no realistic prospect of doing anything apart from surviving. So not a hugely attractive place to go to. Um, 3,000 people turning up on a Saturday in the stadium. And he thought, basically, no one can coach this team, so maybe the team has to coach himself. And this itself. was with regards to the zonal marking from two managers previous. Yeah. And so Klopp... There was a funny, there was a funny story about Klopp actually got somebody else a job maybe before him. Yeah, yeah, Eckhard Krautsen, who uh, who was very recently in the news talking about Klopp and uh, his supposed dream to play for Man United. He was his former manager at Mainz, but Krautsen had called up Klopp um, and talked about all the problems that Mainz had with playing the system that another manager, Wolfgang Frank, had first installed there, a very innovative system by German standards, mm -hmm. back, back four, then. no sweeper. Uh, and, Krauts, and Klopp told him all the problems and um, said, yeah, and this is not working, that's not working. And Krautsen actually, unbeknownst to Klopp, went into an interview to got the Mainz job on the back of sort of getting the inside, uh, inside line of what was going on, but it wasn't really quite enough to make it work. Um, uh, Christian Heidel said that uh, you could kind of feel that this was not really, that he, Krautsen, for all his qualities, also didn't quite know to, how, to make, yeah. how to make the system work. Well, I can, I can understand, can't I? And, you know, move, moving the story forward slightly, obviously you spoke to 40, 50 people about Jürgen Klopp. What is it 
and you've interviewed Jürgen Klopp yourself as well in the past. What is it, do you think, that makes Jürgen tick? What I drives think, him? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I think, first of all, you'll, you'll see in the book the huge influence his father had on him. Uh, Norbert Klopp was a, was a fanatic who wanted his son to be a top tennis player, top skier, top football player. Uh, anything that he did with sport, he pushed Jürgen to the very limits and maybe beyond. I think that that kind of drive, that uh, self-motivation to do stuff, to, to succeed comes very much from his, from his father. But at the same time, um, I think his mum being much more relaxed and balanced gave him, I think, the ability to deal with defeat. Mm -hmm. um, unlike Wolfgang Frank, for example, who found it impossible to deal with defeat and basically lost his nerve every single time his team would lose. And that's one of the reasons why he never really achieved anything as a coach. Klopp realized, I think, that getting beaten is part of the job and it's how you react with it. It's, it's a truism to a certain extent and a cliche, but it's true. How you react it will then define your success or not. Because it's very easy to lose your hope, to lose your belief. And, uh, you know, being of the Liverpool persuasion, I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, he told us all, didn't he? You know, he wanted to turn us from doubters to believers. And, and that was the first thing. And interestingly, later on in the book, you've, you've spoken to Adam Lallana. And Adam Lallana almost reflects that word for word, verbatim, almost about this. It's how you get up from these defeats. And Adam Lallana started to speak about the older you get. It hurts more, but the quicker you get over it. And do yeah. you think that's come straight from Jürgen Klopp? Yeah, I think he's he's trying very hard to get that mentality into the players. I mean, one of his big successes or secrets at Dortmund was to make players take every game at a time. Um, in the good sense, but also in the bad sense. I mean, they were so focused on that single game that they didn't think about what could happen in terms of winning the title. He managed them to, to sort of... Um, almost play with blinkers on mm -hmm. and when they were beaten that also was beneficial because then they could concentrate on the next game and easily forget what happened in the past so I think that the, the ability to take every game as a chance to get things right every game is an opportunity to get that good feeling that you get from winning to progress to play better is something that after a while I think players begin to internalize and and feel maybe also the benefit from thinking in that way because I think as a, as a player it helps you if you can just concentrate on small things. Mm -hmm. You know, on the pitch you concentrate on small things. In the game you try to um, stay focused and inside the game and between games I think it's also hugely important that you can not think about you know, what could happen this season. Can we win the title? Can we get into the Champions League? But actually be much more um, looking at the immediate challenge at hand. And this is something that, again, while Jürgen Klopp's been at Liverpool, we've had problems with um, teams who are lower down the table than us. And this is almost carried over into that, isn't it? I mean, again, Adam Lallana spoke about it to you in the book, about how you need to keep that effort level up and not play it, I think he says, 80 or 90% yeah. when you play in these sides. And again, this is something that Adam Lallana's talking to you, but it's almost like Jürgen Klopp's the fella who said yeah, it first. Yeah, I mean, they, also Pete Kravitz, um, Klopp's number number three, uh, reflected on that, that he felt Liverpool, or shall we say Klopp, and his teams never had enough quality to play at 80%. Mm -hmm. Some teams can do it. The very best teams in the world can do it because they have a Ronaldo up front or they have a Messi. Or the system and the quality is so high that you can manage sort of wins. Um, Liverpool are not quite there yet. Klopp has never really been at a club that's gone into games knowing 80% will be enough. And then it comes down to mentality. And I, I, that was very interesting to me to, to, to listen and to hear almost La 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 admit that they weren't quite able to bring the same intensity and urgency against some of the smaller sides. So it wasn't necessarily a tactical problem, the way that maybe we from, you know, sitting on a sofa look at the game and think, oh, you know, they're tactically they're not quite, they have no idea, but that it comes down more to mentality and effort and the ability to run and try as hard as you would against Chelsea and Man City. And um, I spoke to Lalana just before I spoke to Kravitz, and when mm -hmm. I told Kravitz what Lalana told me, Kravitz went, oh, you know, 
maybe we're one step closer to well, that's illumination it. here well, because if, we feel that the message is getting through. Well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, if those players are, are reiterating that and can see their faults and can see what's going wrong, then Klopp's on the right path, isn't it? And hopefully we've turned the corner at least over the last few weeks. The last three wins have, have certainly provided a platform, if nothing else, to, mm. s to show us that they understand that. Um, moving on again, to, you know, we, we are pressed for time and stuff, apologies. Um, what's your favourite story from the book that you could share with us? Um, favourite story? I mean, one of my favourite stories is one I couldn't write um, for obvious reasons, um, but I think I can explain it. I mean, there was a former sort of acquaintance of his who then went into sports journalism, and uh, when uh, Klopp became a big name, um, Klopp very kindly gave him interviews, and it was a big thing because, you know, he had had a Klopp interview. But then as Klopp became busy and busy, it just was no longer, no longer really viable. So after a while, um, Klopp said to him, just make it up. Um, so uh, <laughs> that guy would just write, write, you know, question and answer interviews and Klopp would call him and say, really like the questions and I really like the answers. Well done. <laughs> really? Wow, that's incredible. Wow, you heard it here first and that's, that's blown me away actually. Okay, um, next question then. What did you learn about Klopp that surprised you the most? I don't think it was so much about what I learned about him, but uh, about the way people relate to him. Because um, I, going into this process of research, I thought I would come across people who had a bit of an axe to grind, mm -hmm. who had problems with him because I knew that there were arguments at Dortmund. I knew that not everybody enjoyed the last, uh, shall we say, 18 months under him. And I thought these people would come out and say, he's a great guy, but I didn't like this, I didn't like that. But not actually. The opposite happened. They said, yeah, we might have, you know, had arguments, but I really love him. Amazing guy, still best friends. So there was, again, it's interesting, just everything, you know, again, a cliche kind of when you say every, you leave everything on the pitch. Mm -hmm. That's really true with him. What happens on the pitch or on training ground, it, it kind of it doesn't matter. Um, six months later, he will still be um, as much of a friend to you and as warm with you as, as before, despite you know having huge fallouts in, in front of the whole uh, whole team sometimes. Yeah. So I thought that was remarkable and very, very unusual in football where um, even the best players, the best managers tend to have enemies and tend to have people who want to take them down a notch and say, yeah, he's overrated, he's this and that. It just didn't happen with Jürgen. Wow, amazing. Okay, well, Rafa, th Raf, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Of Pleasure. course, go and buy the book from all good bookshops now. I've read it. It's an astounding read. Uh, I would recommend it, and I would recommend the other two books by Raf uh, on German football and the German view of English football and how Germany climbed the highest mountains and won the World Cup as well and, and redeveloped their, their football. Uh, so, again, thanks very much for your time. Really Pleasure. appreciate it, and, and good luck with the book as well. Thank you.